Today on Unpacked. This long boost ran up my leg and put me on the hand. By the Saturday, my hands and feet were, were black already. My nose had started dying. My lips had started dying. One of the doctors said, OK, so you're going to amputate her hands and her legs. What are you going to do about her face? And that was when he realised, oh, no, this lady doesn't know about her face. And that was when they had to show me what had happened to my face. Wow. A small animal bite leads to multiple amputations. How in the world does that happen? Today's guest shares her story. Let's unpack. Shannon Lee Fisser is a wife and mother of one from KZN who has been married to her husband, Anthony, for 10 years. Shannon Lee's life took a complete turn in 2017 when a bite from a pet animal resulted in her losing her limbs. It's been four years since she survived what should have been a fatal accident and recovered from multiple surgeries. She is alive and well and here to tell her story. Let's unpack. Joining us via VideoCon is our guest, Shannon Lee. Welcome to the show, Shannon Lee. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Lebo. Thank you so much for having me on your show. So let's start at the very beginning. Take us back to that fateful day where, you know, this tragic event took place, which at the time you might not have even been aware it was that serious. Correct. Um, I was at my friend and boss's house at the time and um, I'll, the, the living area and the bedrooms were separated by a door. I went from the living area, in, the bedroom area, excuse me, to the living area and um, this mongoose ran up my leg and bit me on the hand. I didn't think much of it at the time. I went and I settled it, rinsed it off and doctored it and carried on with my day. So when you say this uh, little mongoose, was it their pet or was it an animal that just was wandering around? No, it was my boss's pet. Okay, and you, you were aware there was a pet in the house at the time? I was aware that there was a pet in the house, correct. And it wasn't an animal you were afraid of or anything like that? Um, it wasn't an animal that I played with. I did try and avoid it mm. um, because they, they do get very territorial and, and that. Um, so I, it's not like I was playing with it or anything like that. Yes, I, I did try and avoid it. And at no point had your boss friend ever expressed that, you know, rather stay away from the animal because of X, Y and Z? Uh, I don't think she realised that it was going to run up my leg and bite me at the time. Um, so, no, I wasn't, I wasn't aware that, that it was going to do that. So, OK, the, the animal bit you and at the time, I mean, did it feel like anything serious or was it a, just a small bite? No, it didn't feel like anything serious at all, Lebo. It was it was a small bite. Um, it did bleed a bit, so I immediately went and I rinsed it. I put dental on it and I put some bact uh, bacterial um, ointment on it and I put a plaster on it and, yeah, I carried on. Mm. So what happened next? That was on a Sunday. It was on the 15th of January 2017. On the 17th of January, I uh, was fine. I carried on with my work day. I had my daughter's parent-teachers meeting that evening. I felt fine going to the parent-teachers meeting and it was during the parent-teachers meeting that I felt a little bit nauseous. So I excused myself. I went to the ladies and I promptly passed out. Um, when I came around, I decided I'm not going to go back into the meeting because I felt terrible at that stage. Mm. I thought, let me get myself home. So when I got home, um, my boss opened the door and she said, oh, are you looking a bit grey? By that stage, I was very, very cold. So put me into bed with lots and lots of bleeding. And yeah, I went, I went to sleep. So you said they put you into, into bed with lots of? Blankets. Okay, okay, because, because you're feeling cold. Because I was cold. very, very cold. Yes, yes, yes. So then what happened next? Um, the, the morning of the 18th, I couldn't get up to get my daughter to school. Thank goodness my daughter and my boss and friends took me to the same school, so she took them to school. Um, the morning consisted of me getting up, being sick, passing out, and it was around about half past two. I thought, let me try and get through to the kitchen and have something to drink. And that was when I collapsed, and one of my colleagues actually found me when I was unconscious. 
Mm. Um, when I came around, I just I heard my boss saying to me, no, we need to get you to the doctor. Something is very, very wrong. Mm. Um, so she then put me in the car and drove me to casualty. And um, I can remember on the way to casualty, my hands and feet were on fire, like a pain I've never, ever felt in my life before. Mm. So when I got to casualty, I explained to the, the nurse that my hands and feet were on fire. She said, no, they, they asked cold, and that was, that was the last I remember. So what happened? Did you, did you pass out at that stage? Yes, I passed out again. Mm. So when you came to, what was happening? I didn't come to, Debo. Um, I was put into an induced coma um, during that time. It was on a Wednesday that I landed up in the hospital. Um, by the Saturday, my hands and feet were, were black already. My nose had started dying. My lips had started dying. Um, my organs were shutting down. I was in an induced coma. I was on life support on a ventilator. Um, I was only brought out of the coma again on the 29th of January. And by that stage, all the all damage had already been done. So, um, in, um, I mean, obviously, we're seeing this from your perspective. So when was yes. it, you know, how long from that time that the nurse was saying, you know, you are so cold and you uh, uh, passing out to you actually being conscious again and remembering what happened? How long was that period? Well, it was on the 18th that I landed up in the hospital and it was on the 29th that I was brought out of the coma. So it was like 11 days. Mm. Mm. And what did you, what do you remember? What's the first thing you remember? The first thing I remembered was opening my eyes and the physician saying to me, welcome back. And I thought, hold on, wait, I don't remember going anywhere. Mm. Um, but I was, I was in ICU and there was a lot of nurses and doctors. My family was, my dad was around me. My husband was there. My brother was there. So, yeah. And w did they bring a mirror to you or did they just uh, start explaining things to you? No, um, while you while I was in a coma, your body obviously goes through a lot of trauma, and um, they didn't want to tell me exactly what had happened. Um, they had done extensive blood tests to find out what had caused this bacteria. Um, my husband did tell the physician that, look, I had been bitten by the mongoose two days before I had um, become extremely ill. Um, but they did extensive blood tests. They couldn't pinpoint exactly that the bacteria had come from the mongoose. Mm. Um, it was just a, a coincidence that this had happened two days before. Mm. Um, so because my body had gone through trauma while I was, you know, in the coma, I mean, all my organs had shut down, my heart was giving problems, mm. my liver, my kidneys and all that, they didn't want to um, bombard me with what had happened, mm. you know. So they kept my hands and feet wrapped up. They were waiting for me to become a little bit stronger. It was during one of the big baths that the nurse didn't wrap my hands up in time. And uh, I saw my hands had, were black. And um, she then called the physician. They then came and told me that this is what had happened. Um, my body had gone into shock. I had sepsis with DRC. Um, and unfortunately, the blood supply to my hands and my feet were limited. Um, to keep my organs, my vital organs alive. And um, unfortunately, they couldn't save my hands and my feet. They were going to have to amputate. Mm. Now, because this was a huge shock, they couldn't, well, they didn't want to tell me about my face at the same time. They wanted me to get over this first hurdle um, and then tell me that my nose and my lips and other parts had died as well. Mm. Because this doesn't happen in hospital every day, I mean, uh, one amputation to a leg or an arm, you know, but because of what I'd gone through, a lot of different nurses and doctors were coming to the ICU, you know, past my room to see what was going on. And it was at that time that one of the doctors said, okay, so you're going to amputate her hands and her legs. What are you going to do about her face? And that was when he realised, oh, no, this lady doesn't know about her face. And that was when they had to show me what had happened. Wow, wow. So basically he didn't get the brief, but it's just so many people were around uh, trying to, to see this, this massive medical case. Correct. I don't find, uh, or I don't feel it was done in a malicious way or yeah. anything because I saw the shock on his face when he realised, 
oh no, this lady doesn't know about that yet. So, were you not in? And maybe just explain to us what what you felt like physically in this time, because um, one might not be able to understand how is it that you're not aware what's going on. You know, even if you don't have a mirror, can you not feel that something feels not right? No, I couldn't feel. I mean, my nose was still there, my lips were still there. I couldn't understand. I kept on asking why I can't get up and walk. They they wouldn't let me get up and walk, and obviously I wasn't able to. Mm. Um, and I found it a little bit difficult to talk mm. um, because I'd also lost the tip of my tongue. My tongue had swelled up, and the tip of my tongue had gone black, so I lost the tip of my tongue as well. But mm. otherwise, no. I didn't, you know, my lips were still there. My nose was still there. It didn't feel any different. Mm, mm. And what was what was the pain like? Um, was the pain just in your entire body or, or certain areas? Look, I was on a lot of painkillers and morphine and, you know, all sorts of things that the horrible side effect was, of course, terrible nightmares. So pain-wise... Touch wood, thank goodness I wasn't in a lot of pain. It was just um, when I came out of the one operation, the one amputation, my arms, that was pain. Like for, for over an hour, they were trying to get the pain under control. That was also pain I, you know, I would never, ever put on anybody else. Mm. Um, so that was one of the things that I can remember pain, um, where it's every like 15 minutes of pain just came in like waves. And um, I can just remember them trying to, like, they couldn't obviously pump me with everything that they, you know, that they mm. had. They had to wait for the wine to start of, sort of start working. And, yeah, it was for, for over an hour until eventually I think they, they sort of put me to sleep type of thing to, to try and suppress the pain. So once now, um, you know, I'm trying to just establish a little bit of a timeline. When you get to the point where you know, this other doctor says, what are you going to do about her face? And you realize, oh, wow, this is actually more than what I thought it was. How much time had passed by then? I think it was two days, Debo. Um, they they brought me out the coma on the 29th of, of January. I was fully out the coma on the 30th. Mm. And um, it was like two days later that the, the physician came to me and said, no, this is what, what we're going to have to do. Mm. And um, my first amputation was on the 6th of February. So the timeline between coming out of the, the, the coma and the amputation was like six days. So it wasn't, it wasn't a long time between having the amputations and when I was told what was going to happen. When, when they told you that they're going to amputate, um, do you recall how that conversation went and what you were feeling? Yeah, well, it was a bit of a shock, but obviously I had at that stage seen what my hands and feet looked like. Mm. Um, they, the only way that like my brother describes it is they looked like dried up bolt chop, basically. Mm. Um, and I can just remember my daughter, who was 10 at the time, my first words were, you've got to do what you've got to do. I've got a, a little girl at home who looks up to me, and if I give up now what example is that going to be to her? Mm. So she was my strength that from the beginning, I couldn't give up for her sake because what what um, impression would that give on her? You know, anything that's put in front of you, just give up. No, you mm. don't give up. There was a reason why I was still here and I was alive. Mm. So I had to carry on. Did the amputations all happen at one go, as in in one procedure? No, I had my legs amputated on the 6th of February. I then had my arms amputated on the 8th of February. And then they started doing the debridgement of the nose and the lips a couple of days later. Mm, mm. I mean, that's a lot of trauma to the body in such a short space of time. What was that first moment like waking up from surgery, realizing that indeed, um, you know, your legs are no longer there? Well, when I went in for my first amputations, um, when you lying on the on the operating table, you don't normally look around you and you know to check what's going on. But something kept on saying to me, "Look behind you, sit up and look behind you." And I sat up and I looked behind me, and there was a cross, 
And I knew then then that that was a sign that my God was with me. He would get me through this. He would give me the courage and the strength to pull through anything. Mm. And um, that was how I got through everything, was knowing that there's a reason I'm still here. I have to fight for my daughter. I have to fight for my family. Um, my life is still, I, I, I'm still alive, so I have to fight for that. So there was no giving up. There was no feeling sorry for myself. There was no why me. It was, do what you got to do. You're going to get through this. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, all of that was done. What did they explain to you the recovery is going to be like after now the amputations and the procedure on your face? Well, the, I'm still going through procedures on my face, Deborah. I've gone through 69 procedures to date. The last one was on the 30th of April this year. Mm. I still have about another 20 operations to go, reconstructive surgeries to my face. Um, but I had a very, very good group of doctors around me, psychologists, physiotherapists, occupational therapists. Um, I went into rehab to learn how to become independent and feed myself, dress myself, bath myself, mm. you know, um, do as much as I can for myself. Um, so I had a very, very good, good group around me that, that supported me and helped me along the way and showed me that anything I put my mind to, if I say I can do it, I can do it. Mm. It's amazing what, what the mind's like. If you say I'm going to try my best to do this or do that 99% of the time, you'll be amazed that you can actually do it. That's when you get that little bit of doubt and think, oh, maybe, maybe not. That's when things start going wrong. So I just put my head down and said, I'm going to do this, and I, I found, found ways to do it. Mm. I'm going to go now to your husband, who obviously... Um, you know, shares a part of this journey. And uh, he will also be joining us via video con. We've got him uh, there on his own line. Uh, Anthony, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Lebo. So maybe share with me your perspective of this whole, whole story and how you fit into the picture. And what was it like for you? Oh, well, Lebo, to start, you know, Shane and I went through a bit of a rough patch, so that's why she ended up in PE. Uh, so we thought it was a time to have a break and mm. she would go and start the new business down there. Yeah, and, you know, gone not even 10 days, 11 days, and then you get this news. You know, it's uh, quite a... It was quite a shock to the system. And mm. then for me to go to PE and find her in the hospital in that condition is not uh, the greatest. But yeah, you know, we just carry on if we have to. So when you when you got the phone call, what was the phone call that you got? Was it by the time that she was in hospital and it was very serious or was it prior to that? It was on the, the day that she was taken to a hospital and then, yeah, I had uh, no other contact, unfortunately, with her boss and colleagues, whatever, that I was getting no feedback. So, yeah, uh, eventually on the Thursday afternoon after work, managed to contact the doctor at the hospital and uh, find out what was going on. Um, and by Friday morning, I was in PE. I caught the first flight from Durban to PE to go and see what's going on. Mm. So, Anthony, now you arrive in PE and you, you know, go to the hospital. What were you met with when you got there? Well, firstly, I found the ICU. I had to go and find out that information or whatever where I could find her. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, you know, walk into the ICU to find... Chan uh, actually looking grey um, mm. with machines and everything connected. Yeah, it was pretty much of a shock, you know, mm. to to walk in and see that. Um, but yeah, over the couple of days that I was there, it was a Friday, I left on the Tuesday uh, again. By that stage, you know, the, by the Saturday, the colour of the hands and everything were starting to, to really take effect. By the time I'd left, like I say, her face was black, her nose, everything was already... Mm. Um, and she wasn't conscious at this time, uh, correct? 
No, not at all, eh? Mm. Nothing. Mm. And I mean, what were the do- were the uh, doctors actually telling you in detail what was going on? Well, you know, at that stage they couldn't find anything. They just told me that you know organs are shutting down and we must prepare for. You know, we we don't know which way, and he didn't. The doctor didn't know which way uh, things would go. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was just a matter of uh, hopefully the bacteria and and with all the medication and whatever that they were putting in her could uh, kill it and revert. You know stop the damage but mm. uh, that was just a, a matter of hope and pray and wait to to wait for it to run its course were you actually still um npe or when she was uh, brought out of uh, uh being unconscious um her brother was there and then i arrived a couple of days after um after that uh before the amputations and stuff like that you know i was still at work at that stage um so i had to leave a couple of days earlier to to go there to be there with her and that for the amputations mm-hmm. i mean did you have uh, now that you've lived um you know the journey following the amputations did you have any idea of what what was going to lay ahead of you um no actually uh, but you know you learn every day and we we find different challenges in different places where we go to but we some somehow or some way we'll make a plan and get around it yeah otherwise we just as we say take one day at a time you can't uh, try and plan ahead of what you know before time just mm. wake up in the morning and see what the day brings same question to you shan um you know they they're telling you that we're going to amputate um did could you even fathom what lay ahead of you um no i i didn't know what lay ahead of me but i knew that i had a, a good team around me and mm. i knew that um i would get get through it and just be be positive and do what you got to do mm, mm, mm. and i mean the reason i asked that is because if if you have never uh been around somebody who's had uh an amputation or uh was born without their legs or arms you might not be able to actually even have an idea of what day to day life is like so now when when you are faced with that reality for yourself it might be a different kind of fear that's in your head when you say i'm so afraid um i was wondering if the fears that you may have are are you afraid of the unknown or afraid of a reality you have gotten a sneak peek into I'm not afraid mm, mm. I'm not afraid uh, like I said before there's a reason why I'm still here mm. um uh my god is with me he's given me the strength to get through this so no I'm not afraid so chat to us then about how that recovery journey went now um they've done all the all the procedures at what point do you now get discharged to go home? Um well because I had to have quite a lot of procedures done in the initial stage um I was I went to rehab on the 23rd of March and um whenever I needed to have an operation done I was then transferred back to hospital mm. and then one side you know a couple of days in the hospital back to the rehab we I would have physiotherapy twice a day and you know mm. learn how to do things again um that was basically what i was becoming stronger for every day was to be able to walk again mm. um i got my prosthetic legs at the end of june and um i basically had a week i was discharged from rehab on the 7th of july mm. my prosthetic guy brought my legs to me and said right today we're going to learn how to sit and stand because being a double leg amputee even with one leg it's you know you got to it's difficult to get your balance and all that and i looked at this guy and i said no i haven't had my legs for how long mm-hmm. you're going to bring them to me now and say today you're going to sit and stand mm-hmm. and i looked around the gymnasium and i saw a walker there and i asked him to please bring me the walker and um yeah i got up and i, I walked and i didn't stop walking and it was for about a, a week 
that I was learning how to walk up and down stairs and then I went to having crutches and I had crutches for about a week as well. Mm. And then I put the crutches down and then I was walking by myself. Can you share for us um, where, um, where the amputations took place uh, physically on your body and how that affects the type of rehab that you have to do, you know, in terms of learning how to walk again, um, in terms of, you know, anything upper body that, that assists you in becoming more independent? My amputations, thank goodness, were below the knee on my legs, so I still have my knees. Mm. Um, my amputations on my arms is basically from the wrist down. Mm. So I've still got my elbows um, and quite a bit of my, my forearm. Mm. So that made things a little bit easier as well, where I didn't have to try and figure out how to use prosthetic legs with a, with a knee and stuff. Mm. I, I still had my knee. It was just the ankle that, that I didn't have. Mm. And and then how does that um, you know explain for the layman why is it an, why is it um, a, a relief that your amputation was be, below the knees why is it a relief that it was just under the wrists? Because the further up your arm it goes, I think the more difficult it is to be able to do things. Whereas now I can pick up a a bottle and I can drink out of it. I mm. can pick up my phone and I can use the end of my stump to use to work my phone. Whereas I think if it was further up my arm, I would have um, had to figure out other ways of, of being independent. Mm. Where now I can dress myself, I can feed myself. If it was a little bit further up, it would be, I think, a little bit more difficult to to do those, those sort of things. Mm. But I would have found a way to do it. Mm, mm, mm. And I think these are some of the things that people don't, you know, we don't really think about it unless it affects our lives as to where uh, an amputation has occurred on the body and what that means for rehab. So now, when were you fully, you know, back at home and um, independent according to your standards? Six months. Six months. Okay. It's actually a, a lot shorter than I would have expected. Well, they were, because I was a very determined person mm. and I wanted to become independent, uh, I did whatever I could throughout the day. And often the, the physiotherapist and the occupational therapist would come in and say, you know what, you're challenging us. We're not challenging you at the moment because mm. you're so determined to get your life back together that, you know, we're running out of you know, ideas and everything because you're just nailing everything on their head mm -hmm. one after the other. So it's that determination, that um, strive, that motivation to to become independent and get my life back and carry on mm. that makes it easier and quick. Because, I mean, even the, pro like I said, the prosthetic guy didn't believe that I'd be able to get up and walk the very first day I had my legs, but I was determined to do it and I did it. Mm, mm. What would you say was the hardest part of your recovery journey? Like the most challenging for you that we might not even expect? The most challenging was the fact that I got my legs, therefore I walked for eight months on my legs. And then because of everything I'd gone through, my skin became allergic to the liners and um, I wasn't able to use my legs anymore. So that wow. was the most challenging. So, so your skin developed an allergy to the, the liners? Correct. And is there nothing that can be done to buffer between your skin and the liner? No, unfortunately, the, the liner goes directly onto your leg and mm. then the prosthetic onto the liner. So unfortunately, with the skin condition that, that I developed because of everything, um, the prosthetic guy, we tried different things and he said, unfortunately, normal prosthetics are just not going to work for me. So what so does that, that mean for you? Um, we spoke about um, different things and if I did not want to be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life, he said that there is a, a procedure that they do overseas called osteointegration, mm -hmm. but had never been done in South Africa through a medical aid before. And um, he spoke to me about the procedure and that, and I said, listen, I've got nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. Let me 
And for the presentation, the presentation was in, in Cape Town. It was in January 2019. Then we go down for the presentation and see what it entails and see if I'm a candidate for this procedure. So I went down and I had a meeting with the surgeon. Um, the main surgeon would be flying out from Australia if, you know, if the procedure was going to happen. And um, they said that I was a, a candidate for this procedure but um, now was a difficult part of trying to get medical aid to give the approval for me to have this operation because it had never been done through a medical aid in South Africa before. Mm -hmm. Now, what this entails is they put a titanium rod in the existing bone in your leg, and then the prosthetic is attached to that. It sticks out of the leg, so there's no invasive socket or liner or anything mm -hmm. directly. Yeah. So that is the difference between this this procedure and having normal prosthetics. Mm. Let me come to you, uh, Anthony. How do you think this journey has affected your relationship? Because you already mentioned uh, prior that you're going through a rough patch when this took place. No, this has uh, brought us a uh, hell of a lot closer. We have our bad days and our good days, like every couple do and whatever, but yeah, um, a hell of a lot better. We we get on a long, lot better, so it's, you know, it's to help each other. Um, I have bad days, uh, so yeah, we just work together, and if we don't uh, teamwork, uh, then if we can't work together, then I don't think this will all be happening. Mm. And how has this... Um actually challenged you as a person? Uh, you know, some days uh, I can't, uh, I can I say, accept that, that it's like this, but uh, you have to. And uh, you want to go and do something, say, well, come on, let's go and do this. And then you think, oh, well, how are we going to, you know, if you say, let's go for a walk on the beach or down to the beach or something like that. Um, yeah, you know, before, I would have taken the chance when Shan could walk to take her on the beach. But now, it's very difficult. Mm, 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 mm. And how, how long has it been like this? How, how, um, how many years has it been like this, this new life, your new normal? Well, I mean, she only had her legs for eight months. So it's been wheelchair-bound ever since. Mm. Um, so you, you know, even like I say, going away or doing things like that, you've got to also have a look at the accessibility at the places that mm. you want to go to. Mm. Because, uh, you know, you go to some friends and invite you out, but unfortunately there's so many steps and accessibility to areas is pretty difficult. Mm. Um, and from your side, um, Shan, I mean, it sounds to me like you had just accepted what was happening from, from you know, uh, uh, the onset. Do you feel like you had to have a moment of absolute clarity to shift gears in where you were mentally? I believe that I am the person now that I was always meant to be. Mm. I believe the person before was a person that was gearing me up, prepping me to where I am now. So, no, I, I don't think I had to gear myself up or anything. I just, I believe that I am who I am meant to be now. Maybe not physically, but mentally. And how did this experience change you as a person? I think it made me stronger. It made me um, appreciate and be grateful for what I, I have and what I can still do. Um, to be more caring and kind to others mm. and think about what they're going through as well because, I mean, I was a very able-bodied person and within two days, I, you know, became really sick and within less than a month, I was... A disabled body. So mm. uh, coming from from that, I uh, sort of, you know, understand what what a disabled person is going through, and for you to realise that they are still a, still a person, you know, mm. and to be treated like a person. Do you think South Africa is accommodating? Do you think we're at a place where, you know, people in your position? have as much accessibility as any other South African? 
Not at all. Mm. Not at all. There's a lot of places that are not wheelchair friendly. Um, and there's, I'm not going to mention any names, but there was a hospital that I landed up in as well that didn't have a, a wheelchair friendly toilet. Um, yeah, I had to get off my wheelchair and basically walk on my knees to to get to the toilet, you know, um, because uh, the hospital wasn't wheelchair friendly. So, mm. no, South Africa has a, a a very very long way to go for for it to be disabled person friendly. Mm. 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 I think that you you have been through so much. Your journey, um, I mean, I, I take away just. The fact that your your mental capacity is probably what pushed your physical healing as quickly as it did. Yes. I didn't sit back and think, why me, you know, why, or take pity on me, because firstly, I wasn't going to get the answers from anybody, so why dwell on that? Mm. And I knew what, what I wanted to do and where I wanted to be, and... Um, I mean, I've got people that I've never met in my life before that are praying for me, that send me well wishes, that, you know, are saying that I motivate them to get up and, and do their best every mm. day. So that also keeps me going. You know, all those those kind, positive words that I'm, I'm getting from people that I've never met before. Mm. So that's what keeps me going as well. Anthony, from your side, any final words or things that you would love South Africans to know? No, I just uh, also pay pay some respect to the disabled people, uh, especially in shopping centres and stuff like that. If you're not disabled, don't use the parking. Uh, I mean, I find that a, a lot is that there's vehicles and people that are not disabled and they use the parking. The parking is allocated there for us to use because it's bigger. Mm. Um, but yeah... Uh, Otherwise, no, just that people should just be a little bit kinder to other people in the world and or even South Africa than maybe other things. things. And from your side, uh, Shannon Lee, final words. Um, Lebo, I started a, a talk show called The Shan Show where, um, because I need to raise funds to be able to walk again because medical aid, unfortunately, has declined. The, the procedure for me to be able to walk again. Um, I thought, how am I going to be able to get other people's stories out there as well as raising funds for myself? And there's a lot of people that are going through hardships that you could be walking next to somebody in the street that is suffering from depression and you you wouldn't even know it because you can't see it. Mm. With me, you can I've got a physical disability. I've gone through something. Mm. But there's people that are going through something internally and you could use harsh words and be nasty to them and, um, you know, imagine waking up in the morning thinking, oh, my word, like a, a, a girl not so long ago who was bullied at school and she went home and she took her life. Mm. Imagine if that person that was bullying the, that that young girl was kind and said kind words to her, mm. things were very different, you know. Um, it costs a lot less to be kind to somebody else mm. than to throw hatred at them. And that's, that's my words, is just be kind to the next person because you don't know what they're going through. And rather be it on your head that you are kind to a person than you are nasty to a person and look at what the outcome is. Mm. So that is what I would say is um, if somebody's got a physical disability, you don't need to whisper and stare. They know they've got a physical disability. They, they're not stupid. So, you know, look and carry on with your life. Don't sit there and whisper and think that they can't hear you because they're not deaf because they've got a physical disability. Mm. They can hear them whispering about them and staring, you know. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, just be kind to the next person. It, it costs absolutely nothing. Thank you so much, Anthony, for, for, for joining us as we discuss uh, the story. Not your personal jo journey, but definitely uh, you are a big part of this journey. And thank you so much to you, uh, Shannon Lee, 
for sharing. I, I just absolutely admire your strength, your your bravery and your courage to go through what you've gone through and to still have such a cool head on your uh, shoulders, to still be so positive about it. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us here. I really appreciate it. And thank you for giving me the, the opportunity to share my story with your viewers. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure and hopefully everybody out there watching uh, can be kinder and maybe hopefully assist. Um, thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Hashtag unpacked with Rilebukhile. As our guests have expressed, be kind to the next person. You really never know what they're going through, and especially to those of the disabled community. So many challenges we still face as a country. What a difference it would make if we as people could do a little bit better and be a little bit kinder. Thank you so much to our guests, and thank you to all of you for joining us. Have a good night. Next time on Unpacked. I was 17 and she mm. was like 22. She was like, no, there's a braai in Germiston. Do you want to come with? I get offered orange juice. At this time, I haven't started drinking. And that's the last thing I remember. Waking up and I'm staring at the sky and it's dark. So I was only wearing a top mm. and nothing at the bottom. Mm. And I was just covered in blood. for watching Unpacked with Rileb Khile Mamoja. Make sure you subscribe to my channel where you can get to watch more episodes. But more importantly, you can be part of our online community. Comment down below, share with us who you'd like to see on the show, what story you'd like us to discuss. We love engaging with you. Keep it coming and don't forget to subscribe.